Welcome back to Gangs All Here, a New York Jets podcast from the New York Post. Jake Brown here alongside Brian Costello, Jets beat writer for the Post at Jake Brown Radio and at Brian Cos on Twitter. Joining us in a little bit later in the show, Jets punter, AFC Special Teams Player of the Week, Thomas Morstead. The guy could talk. Very intriguing answers. A lot of reaction to what Roger said about him on the Pat McAfee show, what he said on McAfee. So you're going to want to listen to Thomas Morstead. Thomas Morstead, a guy who was not part of the trade deadline. Nobody was. Because the Jets will get ready for the Chargers on Monday. But first, the trade deadline has come and gone. And it ended with the Jets signing offensive lineman Roger Saffold, who was a free agent. And uh, get ready, kid. Or I should say vet. You're probably the starting Jets right guard on on Monday night, right? Like, uh, what do you nah, think? Saffold think immediately so. in here if the nah, injuries hold I mean, up? He hasn't played in a year, Jake. I don't, I don't know how they can expect him to be ready by Sunday. I guess maybe, but I wouldn't think so. I would think it'd be probably Billy Turner and Max mm-hmm. Mitchell on the right side in some form. Like I, I might flip them because Turner's used to playing tackle, but I asked Sal about that Wednesday and he didn't sound enthused about that idea. He said he'd like to keep people kind of in the positions they've been in more. So, um, you know, who knows with Dwayne Brown too, if he, the practice window is opening this week, he's a guy that maybe could come back and play right away uh and if that happens they would shuffle the deck and you know then maybe max mitchell ends up at guard but i, I don't think you're gonna see saffold yet and you might have makai back to move to the right side so check yeah. his twitter timeline and see if anything pops up we'll see if there's any frustration there um, he said i mean he said on wednesday jake he just wants to play he doesn't care okay. where he plays so he's gonna have to approach to it yeah all right, break us break down everything you know about the trade deadline, why the Jets didn't make moves, were the, yep. anyone available? I know Ezra Cleveland, uh, a lot of Jet fans were acting like oh. uh, GMs knowing Ezra Cleveland m- might have made you a little bit mad, Kaz, but break down what you know All about right. the trade deadline because you wrote about it. So they were trying they were trying to get an outside receiver, Jake. That's what they really wanted, um, you know, to to kind of give some help to Garrett Wilson, give a big, you know, a big receiver on the other side. Uh called on Mike Evans. Tampa Bay said no way. You know, they weren't dealing Mike Evans. He's kind of an icon in Tampa Bay. They're still in the thick of things. They weren't going to trade him. Uh, They called on Devontae Adams. Obviously, that's a, you know, a no-brainer to call on him. The Raiders said they, you know, no way they were trading him. Uh, (laughs) At the time, like when I talked to people last week about it, the sense they were getting was like, you know, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler were on the hot seat and couldn't really make a move like that you know, and just say, okay, we're going to, we're going to move on because they thought they might get fired at the end of the year. Well, it turns out they got fired a little sooner than that. But uh, I think that was hanging over their heads was like, they, they knew they were in trouble. They couldn't really deal when they're, they're probably their best player, right? Or Max Crosby's in the conversation, but their best offensive player, they couldn't deal him, but the Jets tried and tried and tried on Devontae Adams. I know like even after that Monday night game against Detroit, where they look bad, the Jets call the Jets, checked in again i should say with the raiders after that game to see if that changed anything they were told no Uh, i think adam Schefter was on espn tuesday and said someone told him inside the organization hell no they weren't trading him so it's clear they weren't moving him hunter renfro they could have had hunter renfro if they wanted him the jets did not want hunter renfro uh they did not they don't feel like they really want a slot receiver they feel like they've got some guys there Hunter Renfro also has a huge cap number, even though it's half a year, it's still a lot of money for a slot receiver. Who's not that guy. I think it was $11 million entering the year. I'm not sure what's left on that, but a big price tag. The Denver receivers were available, Jake, uh, Jerry, Judy, Cortland Sutton, but Denver was asking for the moon for them. Um, I heard the Judy price tag was a second round pick plus a player. Jets really weren't interested in doing that. The Jets don't have their second round pick to next year. Right because they dealt it for Aaron Rodgers. Um, but they really weren't interested in those price tags anyway. So that really kind of the receivers, there just wasn't anything there that that made sense for them. Offensive line-wise, there wasn't much movement. Like, you know, as we talked about, I think before, Jake, that you don't really trade good offensive linemen. That doesn't happen. Um, the only offensive lineman of note who moved was Ezra Cleveland. He had been benched in Minnesota. Uh, he's going to be a free agent. So, you know, I, I get it. You guys just want somebody, anybody in here. But if you really look at it, how much of an upgrade is he over what they have? They think Joe Tipman is going to be back soon. They think there's a chance Connor McGovern and Wes Schweitzer could be back in a month or, or a little lo- or longer than that. 
we, are you giving up a draft pick for a guy who's, you know, might be a slight upgrade over your, what you have right now. And the other factor, Jake, is they really didn't feel like he was a fit for what they do. They didn't think he'd be a good fit on their offensive line. Um, so, you know, all those Twitter scouts out there who are breaking down the offensive line tape of the Minnesota Vikings, the Jets disagree with you. They just didn't think he was, he was really a great fit here. What about, I know it's not a huge upgrade, but listen, you're, you're asking Irv Charles, Xavier Gibson, Malik Taylor to step up in a kind of big roles now, especially if Randall Cobb, Cobb was to miss more time. What about like Donovan Peoples Jones? Did they go out and try for him? Was that not worth it for a six round pick? I thought he would have been worth it. I didn't hear Donovan Peoples Jones name from anybody, Jake, honestly, I didn't. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't think they'd think if you, <laughs> Even Renfro, I thought I know that's a lot of money, but they have the money, money for so that's what four or five million left on the contract. It's I think he's an upgrade in the slot, yeah. honestly. Well, they like really like Xavier Gibson and they think he's going to be good. So I hope they see him. They don't really draw up any plays for him. I want to see some. Wow. I know he got banged up last game, so we'll see. Yeah, now he's dealing he's with an ankle, so he had an ankle with Jake before the Eagles game, and I think he may have re injured it in that Giants game when he got rolled up on. So yeah, that's something to watch, but I, I mean. I don't know. It's uh, Hunter Renfro. It's a lot of money, and they feel like they're 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 not they weren't looking to upgrade slot. They they just weren't. That wasn't the position they were looking to do. So I, I think that's your answer. Yeah. Oh, well, listen. And I, you know, I did a Bleacher Report live stream yesterday. I said they have no room for error. If anyone gets hurt, they're in a tough spot. They don't really have many backups. They don't have many guys left. So especially on that offensive line, what do you think of that Saffold? I know he's on the scrap heap. He's a little older. Coming off a couple of decent seasons, uh, maybe not that decent considering he was a free agent, but the guy is durable. He plays almost every game. He almost never gets hurt, knock on wood. So what do you think of that? I didn't think it was a terrible move at this point. Of the season. He's durable. That's like saying she has a nice personality, Jake, huh? Right? I mean, you play and look at the Jets off and no one's playing. Everyone's hurt. Yeah, so. I thought it was a good alternative for like what they had, like, there, there weren't a lot of options out there. So bringing a guy who, who has played a lot of games, he's made the Pro Bowl. I mean, he made the Pro Bowl as an alternate last year. He clearly did not play like a Pro Bowler, but made the, made the Pro Bowl. But he's, you know, veteran, um, going to bring you experience. I, I thought it was a fine option to, to explore. I, I wouldn't expect much from him, though. All right, that's the trade deadline. Now it's Jets, Chargers, Monday Night Football, the Jets in prime time again. And I don't think I'm going to be making the Vegas trip the following week. Uh, once once Aaron went down, I think that uh, those prices, uh, it wasn't worth it to make. Aiden that. O'Connell versus Zach Wilson, Jake. Come on. Oh, God. Um, I cannot believe the National game wasn't TV. flexed. And now with Antonio Pierce. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating, coach. Jake, right? Like, so the Jets have these, you know, I'm sure you've seen the numbers from the networks. Like the Jets have for the top rated game and like mm -hmm. all these different slots. I mean, it was against the Chiefs, the Cowboys, and the Eagles, I think, right, were the three games that people are citing. So, yes, there's a lot of interest in the Jets. I do think it helps playing – those are three national brand teams, right, to, to play. I'm not sure Jets Raiders are going to get that great of a rating, but I guess I guess the networks know what they're doing. Well, listen, I'll say this. If the Raiders beat the Giants, which they're favored to, they're four and five – Jets beat the Chargers. They're five and three. This is a battle for the wild card. It becomes a yeah, – I mean, the Raiders aren't doing anything, but – it's still November 12th, Jake. It's a battle for the wild card. I mean, you, there's still, a, you know, every team basically except the Patriots in the AFC is in it, right? Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's a <laughs> so, meaningful game to both teams. If, if you It's know, a meaningful the, game. I just don't know how many eyeballs are going to be on it outside of the fans of the two teams. Um, you know, I guess the Raiders are, are still a national brand team, but – they've they've lacked in in recent years and i'm um, you know it, we're, i feel like you know i'm saying i'm old at 32 you must feel old too now that antonio pierce is the head coach like we just saw him winning super bowl with the giants <laughs> and now he's the head coach uh the raid what a fumbling what a mess that is on halloween right after the trade deadline uh yeah, did you weird. find that odd at all I, I did i did i mean i think you know i know they had a horrible game monday night i didn't watch it but i heard about it so I don't know. Yeah, it's weird that you you basically were held up for the trade deadline from doing anything because these guys thought they were fighting for their lives, fighting for their jobs, and then a few hours later they're gone. So you wonder if they had made this move a week ago, if Davis would have said, yeah, go trade Devontae, 
you know, this is going to be a rebuild. And I think Jake spinning it forward, will get ready for a lot of Devonte talk this off season. Right. I think because, it's a lock. He's going to be a jet. I think it's, <laughs> it is a lock. I know you guys do, but so, but there's going to be a lot of talk because it's going to be a new regime out there. Are they just going to tear everything down and rebuild it? Uh, and if they're doing that, you know, the first thing you're getting rid of is Devonte. Um, and obviously the jets were very interested at the trade deadline and they can be again, but the price goes up in the off season, Jake. That's that's one of the problems. Like when you see like these trade deadline deals, it's usually kind of favors the buyer. The offseason usually favors the seller. Devontae Adams, Garrett Wilson. I mean, just do it. I don't care if it's a first round pick. Trade the first round pick. It'd probably be 2025, 20, potentially first round pick, because you might have a first and second if you uh, did it. Oh, well, what if you did 2024 first and 2025 second? Yeah, well, then you're out of a few picks. To see. You're not drafting until uh, day two, I guess. The Jets could sit back and relax yeah. on day one. But, man, you just salivated the thought of that, of Aaron Rodgers potentially coming back and throwing to those two guys. Well, well you know he's going to be pushing for it, right? Oh, yeah. He's, you know, he's the GM. He's going to yes. be – he's Joe. Okay. I'm the GM. I call the shots. He will be my receiver. And then Randall Cobb comes back, and he's got Devontae and Randall Cobb again. And it's the Green Bay and Jordy Jets. Nelson. Jordy Nelson can't be far behind. Well, you know, <laughs> bring in Jordy Nelson. Right. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't need Mason Crosby because you got Greg Zerline, so that's fine. But uh, yeah, bring back Jordy Nelson out of retirement and get the whole gang back together. Well, Zach Wilson will be throwing to Garrett Wilson on Monday Night Football. Jets, Chargers, you know, again, still early, but two teams in the race. Three and four Chargers, four and three Jets. The Jets getting no respect at home, Cos. Three-point underdogs. Are you kidding me? Las Vegas, but it's an explosive Chargers offense. Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, Palmer. Um, they got plenty of talent on offense. Break the game down. Make your pick. Yeah, I mean, look, to defend Vegas, Jake, the last two Jets wins, the opposing team had the ball with the lead under two minutes to play oh. and found a way to lose lose the game. So not like the Jets have been overpowering in these wins uh, recently. So I, I understand where Vegas is coming from. And with that being said, Jake, I, I don't have a score for you yet. I, I, well, I'll, I'll try to come up with one. I think the Chargers are going to win this game. I think the Chargers have kind of fixed some of the things that were wrong with them early in the season. Herbert's playing better. Um, I think the Jets are in disarray on the offensive line. It's going to be, they're going to be piecing it together. I think this offense, you know, until I see it, Jake, I won't believe it that they've figured out the problems. 23% conversion rate on third down, Jake. That's the worst in Jets history. Um, you know, you can take your 96, 95, your 2020, your 2019, all those teams that were terrible. They were better on third down than this team. So they got to figure that out. Um, I think Chargers obviously have good, good pass rush with Mac and Bosa. That's going to create issues. Chargers defense overall has not played great. So I, I, I'm i going to go. I think the Jets will score a little bit in this game. I'm going to go 24 20 Chargers. All right. That's close. So you're saying the Chargers will cover that three point yeah, spread. Slightly. Interesting. And the over under is 41 and a half. So you have over and Chargers cover. I think Brees Hall is do he's back-to-back games 12 for 17 12 for 39 now he had some uh <laughs> receiving action but mm -hmm. he did nothing on the ground the jets gotta get him that rock 20 times because it might be the 19th time that he finally breaks one loose i think we're gonna see a revenge game from him and i think revenge for what revenge for the last two bad games oh i thought it was uh, the chargers not the chargers yeah no. i thought you issue with the chargers no the chargers the last time the jets played them was what 2020 the jets lost that game if only they had ezra cleveland Jake. only if they had ezra he, cleveland he'd be gaining so many yards <laughs> he's got roger saffold have no fear Win. he's got dennis kelly have no fear dennis kelly is here jake you're probably not old enough to you do you have you heard of the band better than ezra uh, I know you tweeted that, and honestly, yeah. I had no idea what yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, now so. that's more of a 40 and above uh joke. They were banned in the late 90s. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I was wondering if you know you, you knew that reference. I figured you didn't, yeah, sorry, <laughs> didn't know that. They're one. basically a one hit wonder in like 1999. So, oh, I was listening to In Sync and Backstreet Boys at that time, so yeah, I, yeah. I missed out on the better than Ezra ever, uh, era, but. 
I'm going to take the Jets in this game. I think their defense is playing great. They're forcing turnovers, and Herbert is tremendous, but he takes a lot of dangerous shots down the field, and I think there's going to be a few key interceptions in this game. Brees Hall is going to ground and pound. We're going to see a little bit of trickery. I think this is the week we finally see it. We finally get the Jake Brown playbook, and the Jets prevail. They find a way. Don't ask me how, but 20-17. to Jets win. They improved a five and three and fans are running through brick walls before they head to Las Vegas. And a whole, th- a lot of jet fans are going to Vegas for that trip. So maybe 20 to 17, take- that means the Chargers will have the lead with two minutes left and somehow screw it up and jets will pull it out. Yeah. It'll be like, yeah, it'll be 17, 13 and it'll be a pick six with 10 seconds to go. Some, I don't know, something oh, crazy. Pick six. Yeah, that, that actually didn't make sense. But it was 17, 13, like two minutes left. They intercepted, they score. I don't know. Something crazy happens and uh, the Jets win 2017. Well, a guy who's been a key part of the Jets winning and is finally getting the love and he's the special teams player of the week. That's Thomas Morstead. He joins gangs all here next. Gangs All Here podcast, Jake Brown, Brian Costello, New York Post, here with the man of the hour. Joining us now is a punter who's been in the league for 14 years, a Houston native, SMU alum, a Pro Bowler, Super Bowl champion, and he joins us this week as the newest AFC Special Teams Player of the Week. Let's give a warm Gangs All Here welcome to Jets punter, number five on the field, number one in our hearts, Thomas Morstead. Thomas, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, Jake. Thanks for having me on. AFC Player of the Week, Special Teams Player of the Week. Do you get a Rolex? Do you get a truck? (laughs) Do you get an extra check? Is there any kind of award gift that comes with it? No, no no award, no gift, um, which is okay. That means I don't get taxed. So um, (laughs) it's it's just a nice honor. That's it. Thomas, you know, punters for the most part, kind of work in obscurity most of the time, right? Knowing what's it been like this week with, with all the accolades and attention that you've gotten after that game against the Giants? Uh, it's been a lot. Um, it's been a really cool experience. I think the fact that it was the the New York, New York game uh, kind of made it extra special. And, um, you know, it was um, – you know, certainly a game I'll never forget. A lot of fun to be a part of. Can you give a follow-up on the story Aaron Rodgers told on the Pat McAfee <laughs> show about uh, your wife calling Aaron Andrew and him calling her Daphne? Like, is that like an inside joke? Has that actually happened? Did she actually not know his name? Well, give us the it, backstory of that. No, it was an inside joke, and now it's not. <laughs> so, uh, which was hilarious. Um no, so my mom is from England, and uh, they, my parents were visiting from London, and uh, I just had, you know, I'd become friends with Aaron, and I said, Aaron, I know you get hit up all the time. I said, if you could shake my mom's hand, she would die. Like, she just, she loves you. She's been a fan of yours for 15 years, you playing with the Packers, and um, it would just be really, be really meaningful. So after practice and training camp, he came over and he must have spent seven or eight minutes with my entire family. He's chasing my kids through my legs. I mean, he was so, he was just, he just so showed such a humility. It was kind of cool to see that side of him. And um, anyways, we're all, you know, we're wrapping up and, and Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And my wife who absolutely knows who Aaron Rodgers is just says, nice to meet you, Andrew. And, <laughs> and, and Aaron, looks at her and just says yeah sure call me whatever you want walks off <laughs> hilarious right and uh before my wife can even you know she's stuttering she's like uh, i mean uh, and so anyways lauren tells me about it she's absolutely mortified and say by the family go in the weight room and aaron's just waiting for me and i see this big old grin on his face and uh, i walk over there and i said dude you just gave us a story of a lifetime i mean we'll never gonna she's never gonna live this down and he, he was so humble. He just said, he said, you know, it's really refreshing. You know, sometimes everybody wants a PC when you're somebody that's as big of a name as him. And for some, for her to give him the wrong name, he was so, he thought it was so funny. And he said, you know, tell Daphne the next time I see her, um, you know, we're going to laugh about this. And so uh, obviously her name is Lauren. And so every time 
he asks how Lauren's doing. He just says, hey, how's my girl Daphne doing? And it's become an inside joke. So when I saw that he shared that on Pat McAfee's show, which has huge reach, it made it even better, you know? And so we've got the family text message going right now. Everybody's loving it. And, um, you know, it's giving us all a good laugh. So. What did Lauren say when she saw he said it on McAfee? Well, it was funny because I actually showed it to her. I said, sweetheart, she was helping do some school with my youngest daughter. And uh, I said, I really need you to come watch this right now. Just give me two minutes of your time. And I played it for her. And, and I, I wish I'd have recorded her watching this and her because I'll never forget it. It was it was a thing of beauty. Um, she was just totally, uh, you know, uh, it was just a, a hilarious, hilarious thing. And she just filled with sort of like uh I don't know if shame's the right word, but I mean, she was just embarrassed as could be. It was so funny. She was so cute about it. And uh, anyways, I texted Aaron. I just said, I appreciate you sharing that because I, you know, I was, I was barred from ever speaking of that event. So now it's, now it's out in the public and everybody knows. So it's good. Good time. Great. How big, you know, you talk about Roger's relationship. He's, he's a reason, you know, kind of a reason you came here. Has it lived up to the hype now being his teammate and, and being, you know, obviously he gets hurt early, but he's still around. Has, has it lived up to the hype? Has it been as cool as, as you expected or even better? Um, yeah, look, I was excited to have him be a part of the team. I didn't have a super fond um, um, perception of who he was from what I'd seen in the media for years over, you know, he's kind of an abrasive guy and, He's not just going to give the company line and he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, ruffled feathers over his course of his career. And all you have is your perception of what you see and getting to know him has been really refreshing. I, I've really grown fond of him. I mean, he's, I think he's a misunderstood guy and uh, you know, he's brought on some of the stuff on himself with the ways, you know, worded things. Um, but, um, you know, getting to know him, he's a really, I mean, he loves connecting with people and he really gets to know people and um, guys that he's played with that I know that I've played with in the past, they all swore by him. They're like, you're going to love this guy. And it's been the truth. He's been great to be around. He, he really is interested in getting to know everyone around him and um, just invest in people around him. And it's really cool to see. It's kind of like I'd almost say he's a little bit of a master psychologist in a way just knows how to connect with people it's a really awesome thing to watch him do and um yeah i mean i think him being we don't see him every single day so he's doing his rehab and then all of a sudden he shows up on on game day and he's out there and he's you know he's doing a little more than he was doing last week and you can see the you can see the the rehab process um the little stair stepper every week something new and you know that sort of crazy hope that he put out that he could come back this season i think there's some real magic to him being out there every week for all the guys to just see that he's he's doing as as much as he can to try to make that kind of what seems impossible you know thought that he could come back to, he's keeping that sort of hope alive a little bit i think with everybody and it's and it's powerful um it's i mean it's just seeing him without his without a you know boot on two weeks ago three weeks ago whatever it was uh, before the eagles game throwing out on the field it was like i mean that's energy you know it was cool to see so so him being there does fire you guys up it does rally the troops a little bit because a lot of jets fans have said that you know we're saying you know him being there look what they did against the chiefs almost winning his first game back and every week he's there it seems like you either win or come close to winning beat the eagles so you're saying there is something to him being there in that fire. I, guys. I'm just, I'm just speaking for myself. I see it. And it is, I don't know that guys need rallying, right? We got a good crew of guys here. I mean, if, if that's not evident, if you can't be proud of the way guys are fighting right now, you know, I don't think you, I think you're an unrational fan, which I guess that's the definition of being a fanatic anyways, but um, to, to, to see the way guys are fighting and going after this thing and never giving up. I mean, every game, we could be six and one or we could be zero and seven right now. I mean, we've had so many close games. It's just come down to it. And uh, so I don't know that he's rallied the troops. What I would say is it's inspiring to see. And, and it's, and it, and it gives you a hope. That's um, also, it's just cool to see. I don't know how to, how to say it's just really inspiring. And you can see that he's giving everything he has to, to, to try to, 
not only get back to be playing at some point this season, potentially, but also just whether that happens or not, just being around, showing guys that he's attempting to do that, it's inspiring to see. Thomas, you were pretty emotional after the game on Sunday. What what kind of led to those emotions, um, you know, in the locker room? Um, well, that's a long answer, but um, you know, I guess the best way I just kind of go through my timeline. You know, I, you know, I think if you pulled people in the league and said who was the best punter in the 2010s in the NFL, I think I'd be that guy. And um, I've had an incredible career in New Orleans. And my last year in 2020, a few weeks before training camp, I hurt my back. And I had a vision issue that also kind of crept up on me. And I just couldn't get over it, the back deal. And um, I had a really down year. And I think just the fact that I turned 35 that offseason, had a back deal, really scared people away. And no one would even give me a workout. I mean, it was just tough. And I got to come in here and it was a relatively safe situation. You know, they had Braden here and I could fill in and for some young guys for a few weeks and coach Salas for a season. And it wasn't going to be stressful on anybody. It was going to be me get my foot back in the door and adding some value. And, and then I came in and played well and kind of made it hard on. Them. And I think I showed the whole league that I'm back and playing at a high level. And so um, I left on great terms. Um, here, it, the, t the team was great to me and they communicated with me the whole time and to, to, you know, go finish out with the Falcons and then, and then go to Miami last year and then get a chance to come back here. Um, and to feel like I've kind of found a bit of a home here. Um, it's just, you know, when you go through losing something and it could be over, and you don't want it to be over and you give everything you have to try to get back in with no guarantee of you actually happening. Um, and to have a game like that and not only game, the whole season, I feel like it's been a, just a phenomenal year where not only when I was playing well, which I've been doing for the past three seasons now, but to, to be in games that are so close where those, those, those yards or those differences are mattering. Um, it's just been very rewarding and, um, you know, I kind of committed to getting back um, just at the chance of that. And to be here doing it, it was just, I kind of just was overwhelmed after the game. It's been a long road to get back. And um, which one did I just didn't, I don't even know if I ever expected that I could find a situation like this where it was kind of like it was in New Orleans. So, um, it's just overwhelming. And um, they caught me in the tunnel right after the game. And I wasn't, you know, wasn't able to, you know, come down off of that. And they just kind of caught me in a moment. And I'm glad they did because it was, uh, it was meaningful. I'll, I'll save that little video clip um, for myself down the road. It was a cool, cool moment for me. Yeah. I mean, it's been incredible to watch this year because listen, the trials and tribulations us Jets fans on special teams have gone have to go through the last decade from punters to different kickers to, you know, this guy into a vet Vic kick guys with kickers. we never heard of you have brought, you know, a breath of fresh air, you and Greg, the leg, I mean, Greg Zerline, you knew that was going into the end of the fourth quarter. You knew an overtime was going in. You two have been an iconic duo this season and it's been fun to watch. You get all the hoopla this week. Are you soaking this all in? Are you loving this? Like going on McAfee ESPN, Coming on the critically acclaimed Gangs All Here podcast <laughs> with me and Brian Costello, is are you just soaking in every kind of interview, every kind of attention, the awards? Like it's got to be fun at this point of your career. It is, um, no question, and I'm definitely soaking it in. Um, kind of, you know, you hear about coaches or players talking about 24 hour rule. I kind of generally wait till my first punting session of the week to either get over being miserable or to get get over being, you know. Isaac Height on on the performance. So um tomorrow's that day for me. So I'm kind of just enjoying it. Um it's been fun for my family as well. Uh a few of my kids were at the game and got to see it. So that was cool. Um so yeah, I'm just absolutely enjoying it. Like I said, when you when you lose something that you don't want to lose and you get it back, um, it's special and it's impossible not not to see it in a different light. Um so yeah, I'm definitely enjoying every moment of it. Thomas, just to go back uh, further into your past, the um, 
it was funny. My daughter was watching that movie, that Sean Payton movie they made, that Disney yeah. movie they made a few years ago, right? She was watching it. And then they referenced the onside kick in that movie. Like, that is probably one of the most iconic plays, definitely in Saints history, but in Super Bowl history. Um, that play. What What's it like to have that play kind of as part of your story? And how often are you asked about that play? Uh, all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... You know, it's been a blessing for me in a lot of ways. Number one, you know, obviously winning the game and getting to, you know, kind of re- reach the uh, the top of the mountain um, as a professional is really cool as a team. Um, being a part of the city of New Orleans, just history is cool. That's our home now. And um, so that's cool. And then, you know, being a part of a group of guys that did something special together. Um, it's kind of like a lifelong thing that you get to do. You know, we've already had a 10 year reunion. I was still on the saints when we had the 10 year reunion. So that was cool to have all those guys come back and I'm sure there'll be a 20 year reunion and a 30 year reunion and a 40 year reunion. You know, it'll be, uh, it'll just be a really, it's a, it's a lifelong thing that you get to be a part of. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that those relationships, you know, I was a young dumb kid that, just had tunnel vision on punting and wasn't aware of all the team dynamics as a rookie, but you know, you come back and guys that, that you weren't particularly close with or didn't have, you know, the best relationship with, you know, you're, you just in hugs and it's like, just, it's something you carry with you forever. And then for, on the, on the professional side of just playing and, you know, the, the special team, so much of the game is just up here and what's this doing, this brain of yours and how it gets in your way sometimes. And, um, you know, to be able to look back on this like super stressful moment where coach is going to ask a rookie to hit an onside kick. He's never done this in his life um, in the biggest game on the biggest stage and all the ways that that could go wrong or right. And to, to get it done in that moment of stress, it's so many times throughout my career, been able to remind myself that I have got the goods. I've got the ability to, talk myself into being confident when maybe I shouldn't be, if that makes sense. And to have that and so many other times where, you know, it's a big moment, you go out there, you know, it's a big moment. And to be able to remind yourself in moments that you're not confident that you should be confident, even unrationally. So, and so um, it's been a blessing for me in my career in that way as well. So um, yeah. Yeah, in the Super Bowl, your rookie year. I mean, you, it's you shows you how hard it is to get there, how hard it is to win one. Maybe it happens. Hopefully, this year, maybe next year. You know, with the Jets, do you still practice onside kicks now? And do you envision yourself at some point this year, uh, you get the call, call from Boyer Sala and, and maybe pull it off again in a big game? Yeah, I mean, look, I I still hit a few of them here every week just to make sure they're there. Uh, the one about the one in the Super Bowl that I hit was unique because I was kicking off at that point, and I, you know, I'm, I I kicked off against the Patriots for a week, but I I'm, you know, Greg's our kickoff guy, so as far as hitting a surprise onside kick, um, you know, I think I think if I'm hitting them, everybody knows they're probably coming, right? Uh, <laughs> Greg Greg Greg's the guy that's kicking off, so. Uh, you know, we're all, we're all always staying ready for all the situations we could potentially be asked to, you know, perform in. And, um, you know, for me personally, you know, five, six weeks ago, whatever it was, when we played the Patriots, it was, it was cool for me to go kick off. I mean, I had done it in eight or nine years and, uh, I didn't honestly, I didn't know if I could still do it uh, at a high level. So it was cool to hit a few touchbacks and, and, uh, and get to experience that again. Cause I, I do miss kicking off. It was, uh, when I did it a decade ago, I was the best in the league at it. And I, and I, and I do miss doing it. It was fun. Last one for me, Thomas. You said New, you live in New Orleans. That's home now. Where, where's the best? What's the best restaurant in New Orleans? That's like, there. There's no. Food there's, town. Yeah, there's no answer to that. There's too many good places. Um, I always tell people when they come in town, if you've never heard of it, it's probably damn good because it wouldn't survive because there's there's too many other good options. Um, but there's just so much. There's so many people that have small businesses down there that have, uh, you know, studied under Emerald or studied, studied under, you know, these different people that are, that are down there. There's so many uh, James Beard award-winning chefs down there. So, um, you know, and, and it's, it's almost like, you know, I once asked somebody, I said, is it, is it bad when this new restaurant opens up next year? Does it take your business? And they're like, no, we want more restaurants opening because more and more people will come down here 
it's the more the merrier. So that it's kind of a cool, it's almost like everybody's on the same team, if that makes sense down there. It's just part of the culture of the city. It's a, it's a cool place to be. I can imagine you've enjoyed the eateries in the New York area. I know you're next to CJ Uzama's locker. His spot is uh, Le Barret in the French restaurant in Manhattan. Have you been I've there? Heard, I've, you... I've heard. I, ha- I haven't been yet. I've, I've oh, heard. Gotta go. I've heard they're big fans of the Jets down there. So I'm um, definitely going to make my way down there at some point. But we haven't, you know, we're. We're, we're pretty far into Jersey out here. Um, and so we, you know, I've got four young kids. And so the long voyages to uh, get into the city don't, they're not as worth it um, whenever we've got the whole crew with us. So we've done a lot of, you know, checking out the restaurants um, kind of within 15, 20 minutes of where we're out, out here in Jersey. And there's been a lot of good places so far. So it's been good. Well, you'll love LeBaron and my guy, Mike, there runs a huge Jets fan. Some of the guys were, were just there the other night. It's a great spot. Uh, you see yourself sticking around here with the Jets for a while. Do you, do you have a, a lot of leg left in you? Can you play into your forties here? Uh, you know what? People started asking me that when I turned 30. Um, and I've just always said, um, as long as I feel like I can be a value add for my team and I love doing it still, um, um, then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep kicking the can down the road as long as I can. I love doing it. Um, there's nothing like it being counted on in big moments and being a part of a team, Um, the experience you get to provide your family, your kids get to watch you. I mean, my, my kids are old enough. They're going to remember a lot of this stuff now. And that's, that's super, super cool. And so, you know, to say, you know, when guys say, I want to play this many years, I don't, that just seems arbitrary to me, right? You either love doing it and you can do it at a high level or you can't. And so um, if you told me I was done three years ago, I would have been like, yeah, that could have happened. If you told me this is my last year, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if this was my last year. And if you told me I was still playing in five years, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. Um, I love the training. I'm a gym rat in the gym. Body's holding up really well. I feel good. I feel like technically, um, you know, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's many people that have, punted the ball with the efficiency that I have in the history of the game. Um, Not the strongest leg in the world, uh, but I can still, I can still hit it pretty good. And, uh, but I just feel like the consistency is where is the name of my game and has been for a long, long time. And until that starts to diminish or fade, um, you know, retirement's not really in the vocabulary right now. Yeah. And and you still are electric out there running up and down the field, like crazy, the energy, the exuberance. Uh I know, look, I'm a weirdo, but it's just, I know what I need to get going and, and I know how I like to play the game and, and I'm just having fun. That's the best way I can put it. What's the key to uh, keeping the uh, stash groovy like you got it? Well, I've never had one before. This has started because Aaron left um, week one and, and you know, the old white guy in the, in the locker room with the mustache, like we missed him. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let this thing go for a little bit and see how it goes. And, uh, it's been working well for me and my wife hasn't made me cut it yet. So I'm going to keep it going. Um, all right. and the wife's allowing it, keep it all year. Old white That's guy right. with a stash in the locker room. And then maybe Aaron comes back, you shave it, but the way you're, you're punting right now, you know, it might be bad mojo. So let's keep it around the seventies porn stash, whatever you want to call it. We'll keep it going. Thomas Morstead, AFC special teams player of the week, jets punter. Let's keep winning. You know, whether they're ugly, they're not. Keep winning. Let's get to the playoffs, and we appreciate you coming on Gangs All here. Guys, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Go Jets. Thanks, Thomas. Sure. What a fantastic interview with Thomas Morstead. He was really good. A lot of good insight, a lot of good stuff on Rodgers. He's a fun story. The guy's got confidence. He's got exuberance. He is a tremendous addition to the Jets, a guy who was here before. They probably should have never let leave the building for Braden, man. Braden, man, what a miss he ended up being after – the incredible start he got off to Morstead looked good and he looks like he should be here to stay. Well, we're not here to stay because the show's over. That wraps up episode 160 of Gangs All Hero Jets podcast from the New York Post. Thanks to Andrew Hartz and the intern Mason Verdicchio for helping me produce the show. Catch up on all old episodes on Apple's podcast, Spotify, Google, Amazon, wherever you get podcasts. Give us a five star rating right in a nice review if you're watching us. On that New York Post Sports YouTube page, if you're not, subscribe to the New York Post Sports YouTube page. That is a tongue twister. Give us a thumbs up below. Comment below your predictions for Jets Chargers Monday night. Let us know what you thought of Thomas Morstead. Cool guy. I'd love to have a few beards with Thomas Morstead. Just the stash, the vibes are immaculate. Well, the Jets Chargers Monday night. 
I think a good chance if, if the weather permits, I'm going to make this one. I kind of want to go as a fan. You know, I, I might go as a fan of this one, tailgate, have a good time. And then we'll be back here on Tuesday morning with a new episode, post game episode of Gangs All Here. And let's hope the Jets are five and three. This this game to me is a toss up. I'm taking the Jets. Maybe that's a bit of homerism, but I think the defense is playing really, really well. And I think there's going to be a key turnover that decides this football game. Hopefully, that's not by Zach Wilson. We'll talk to you all Tuesday on Gangs All Here. Happy November. Thanks for listening to Gangs All Here. We'll talk to you Tuesday. Bye-bye.